Well, a very good afternoon, morning, um, evening for everybody around the world. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this, uh, the annual Steve Lawn Memorial Lecture. Um, and we have a wonderful program lined up for you. I am the director of the Desmond Tutu uh, HIV Center at the University of Cape Town um, and the CEO of the Health Foundation. Um, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center, which is in the Department of Medicine at the University of Cape Town, as well as the Institute of Infectious Diseases Molecular Medicine at UCT. I also welcome you on behalf of the TB Center at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, the International Union Against uh, Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, and the Lancet, all of whom uh, have been great supporters of this annual lecture. And of course, for the next hour and a half, we will reflect, remember, um, very warmly uh, recall our alliance, our friendship, our partnership, our collegiality with the late Professor Steve Lawn. And it is a wonderful time to remember not only the, the work that Steve did, the contribution he made, but the man that he was. And we want to especially welcome and thank uh, Joy for joining us this afternoon and also the family and the friends of, of Steve. Of course, we all count ourselves as friends. And so I also extend the welcome uh, to all of you uh, around the world as we do go through the next hour and a half. Uh, next slide. I will just remind you that um, this session is being recorded um, and also that uh, we hope for those of you who haven't been able to make it, we will put the recording out and please share it with friends and family who perhaps weren't able to make just this time. Over the next hour and a half, we will be hearing from some wonderful speakers uh, who will be introduced in a moment, but I would ask all of you, if you have thoughts or questions, uh, please place those uh, thoughts, questions in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat and we will be very pleased uh, to call on the experts on the panel today to answer any questions as they come up. To commemorate World TB Day, which happens at the time of, of this, uh, this lecture, and of course it is tomorrow, International World TB Day, we uh, put together a small video of the work we have continued to do even after Steve had left us, um, after eight years of spending time with us at the Desmond Tutu HIV Center. And this afternoon, I'm just gonna, uh, we've, we've put together just two excerpts from that video, one highlighting the importance of reducing stigma and the other um, bringing attention to one important area of research. So let's hear that short video. South Africa has the highest TB prevalence in the world at 852 cases per 100,000 adults aged 15 years and older. If we're ever going to get the South African and global epidemics under control, we need to focus more on TB stigma, case finding, and the gendered inequities associated with TB. I'm Professor Robin Wood, um, Emeritus Professor of Infectious Diseases at the um, University of Cape Town. And uh, my interest is um, in TB, but particularly TB transmission. And I do remember Steve, Lawn um, and I had offices next to each other and I remember a discussion we had um, many years ago where we said uh, South Africa has an amazing amount of TB but we're not going to be able to control it until we understand how it's transmitted. So this unit here is, um, it's got the name of the Aerobiology um, Research Centre but essentially what we're doing is we're looking at why TB transmits so readily in South Africa, particularly amongst people living in poor circumstances in uh, townships. 
Well, I think that uh, the way we've been trying to control TB is with the tools that were developed over 100 years ago. And I think it's a really exciting time to be in TB research because we're now um, applying much more modern techniques to uh, understand the disease, particularly molecular uh, DNA analyses, RNA analyses, the ability to look at uh, uh, very small numbers of chemicals with mass spectrometry. So what we're doing is we're applying some of the newer very new technologies to a very old disease mm. and I think uh, that's a very exciting time to be involved with TB research. This World TB Day we commit to investing to end TB and save lives. Well thank you. Uh, as I say, just a little taster of what has continued. Steve has left us but TB unfortunately has not. Um, and the work goes on. And I just remind you all that what we are asked to remember this World TB Day is that we should invest to end TB. And here, certainly, the investment in research is one that we would like to encourage. I take this, uh, again, quote from a report now, a little, a uh, few months old from the Treatment Action Group, a staggering amount of, of 103.8 billion has been thrust into COVID-19 vaccine development within a period of 11 months as compared to a paltry 9.5 billion, 8.5 for HIV, the lion's share of that paltry amount, and a particularly paltry amount of 1 billion for TB, for HIV and TB research and vaccine development during the 11 year period from 2009 to 2019. So extraordinary, um, you know, scales, log scales of difference between uh, these three uh, epidemics that we face right here in, in Africa. Next slide, please, Kerry. So we have, since the time that we lost Steve and, and these, in, these lectures were formulated, we have seen uh, a number of wonderful speakers. Here you see Robin Wood, um, I thought it would be useful to or poignant to have him back on the screen. He was a very close confidant of Steve's and they really did make a huge contribution together. Liz Corbett, um, Peter Piot, Erin Matsuledi, Graham Mankeys, all having contributed over the, the years. And of course, here we are now in 2022. Um, and it is my pleasure now to hand over at the next slide, I think it is, um, to uh, the my boss, um, the terrific Professor Ntebeko Ntuzi, who is the Chair of Medicine um, at the University of Cape Town, the Head of Medicine. Um, and I know Ntebeko will uh, take great pleasure in introducing our awardee uh, lecturer in 2022. Over to you, Ntebeko. Thank you very much, uh, Linda Gale. Greetings, friends and colleagues. Today's lecture is organized in honor of the life and work of Stephen Lawn, who would have been 56 years old today. Steve was a professor of infectious diseases and tropical medicine at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and an active member of the TB Center at the London School and worked closely with the Desmond Tutu HIV Center at the University of Cape Town, where he was based from 2005 to 2012. Born in 1966, Steve grew up in Yorkshire and read medicine at the University of Nottingham, where he met Joy, the love of his wife, whom he married in 1989. Completing his clinical training in infectious diseases in London, he then moved to Ghana, where he led tuberculosis research. From there, he moved to Atlanta in the US as a Wellcome Trust Fellow to conduct laboratory research on HIV and tuberculosis, subsequently returning to London, working at St. George's Hospital and the Hospital for Tropical Diseases before moving to Cape Town with Joy and their two children, Tim and Joanne, in 2005. Steve is remembered by many for having worked tirelessly to improve the diagnosis and treatment 
of tuberculosis amongst people living with HIV and AIDS. He authored over 250 publications, receiving numerous awards and touching many lives. He sadly passed away from an aggressive cerebral tumor in September of 2016 at the age of 50 years. The annual memorial lecture in his honor was established by the Union, the Lancet, the University of Cape Town, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to celebrate both the values and virtues that Steve represented as a scientist and a human being. This year's memorial lecture, I'm delighted to announce, will be delivered by Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, who was appointed the World Health Organization's first chief scientist in March 2019. Before that, from 2017 to 2019, she was the Deputy Director General of Programs at the World Health Organization. Dr. Swaminathan originally hails from Chennai in India, a pediatrician by training. She is globally recognized as a leading researcher on tuberculosis and HIV, and has over 30 years of experience in clinical care and research, having worked throughout her career to translate research into impactful programs. Sonia received an MBBS from the Armed Forces Medical College in Pune, followed by a research MD from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. She completed a postdoctoral medical fellowship in neonatology and pediatric pulmonology at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles and at the Keck School of Medicine at USC. Following stints at the University of Leicester, as well as uh, a senior research officer and adjunct associate clinical professor at the Tufts University School of Medicine. She then joined the National Institute of Research in Tuberculosis in India, where she would later become its director. From 2009 to 2011, she was the coordinator for the UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank, WHO Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases in Geneva. And from 2011 to 2013, served as director of the National Institute for Research in Tuberculosis in Chennai, and was subsequently appointed as director general of the Indian Council of Medical Research and secretary of the Department of Health Research in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare for the government of India. In that position, she focused on bringing science and evidence into health policy, building research capacity and forging South-South partnerships in health sciences. Dr. Swami Thanan has published more than 450 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters, is an elected foreign fellow of the US National Academy of Medicine and is a fellow of all three science academies in India. The WHO science division's role is to ensure that the WHO stays ahead of the care and leverages advances in science and technology for public health and clinical care, as well as ensuring that the norms, standards, and guidelines produced by the WHO are scientifically excellent, relevant, and timely. And her vision is to ensure that the WHO is at the cutting edge of science, able to translate new knowledge into meaningful impact on population health worldwide. Dr. Swaminathan is going to speak to us about lessons from COVID and how to accelerate tuberculosis research. Sumia, we are delighted uh, to have you and very much look forward to your Stephen Lawn Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Tobacco. Thank you, Linda Gale, and greetings to Joy and family members of Steve. Uh, firstly, I must say how honored and delighted I am to be 
giving this lecture in his memory and, and his honor. Uh, I knew Steve um, because we were both um, researching, you know, more or less same similar themes at the same time. And we would often compare notes when we met at the Union TB conference. I was researching TB HIV in Chennai and in, in South India. And of course, Steve was based in Cape Town. And we often found that we were confronted with similar problems, even though the scale of HIV in terms of the percentage of the population affected was much higher and continues to be in South Africa compared to the percentage in India. But the problems of TB uh, associated with HIV infection, the high mortality rates and, and all of the other um, socio-behavioral aspects of these diseases, including stigma, uh, were also something that, that we were confronting. Um, over the last uh, two years, of course, at the WHO, I've been, uh, as a chief scientist of the organization, working very closely with the leadership with the emergencies program in tracking the pandemic, in uh, tracking all of the research that's happening, um, as well as uh, making sure that our guidelines you know, are updated as soon as there's new data available, new evidence available that we're able to disseminate it. And at the same time, we have also been fighting misinformation or what we call the infodemic. And so I thought it might be quite uh, interesting to, to take some of the learnings from the COVID pandemic, particularly as related to how research has happened, because I have had a sort of a uh, 30,000 foot view of the research uh, enterprise around COVID and uh, often thought to myself over the past two years, I wish that there was this much energy and investment and excitement about in research for TB. So that's really the theme uh, of today's talk and, and we can go to the next slide. Um, Steve was always uh, pushing the boundaries, he had as his North Star always uh, patient outcomes in mind. I think everything that he did, he did because he wanted to improve the outcomes, he wanted to improve the lives of people who were living with TB and who were living with HIV associated TB. So it was not an academic pursuit for him or the publications that mattered. But I think what gave him satisfaction and what gives all of us researchers satisfaction, I think, is to know that something, a finding that you have had uh, or a discovery that you've made actually saving lives, whatever, whether it's maternal and child health or whether it's tuberculosis or, or COVID or, or any other uh, area of research. I think that's what gives researchers really a great deal of uh, satisfaction and I know how difficult it is to translate research findings into policy and have those implemented at scale because I faced those challenges myself and I must say that a lot of Steve's work did find its way very quickly into policy and practice both at the level of the WHO guidelines but also uh, in South Africa where it was implemented so I'm sure that he drew a great deal of uh, happiness and satisfaction from that. Next slide. So I um, would like to just touch, of course, on the current status of TB. We've heard from Linda Gale, tomorrow's World TB Day, and, and we're not really doing as well as we should. A lot of it is be also because of the impact of COVID on TB. I'd like to look at the current gaps uh, and research priorities, the lessons learned, and, um, and then end with how we, I think we should uh, really refocus our efforts on TB in a very integrated, holistic, comprehensive and multi-sectoral way. Next slide, please. Next. We know that we have several goals and we have the SDG goals, but we also have, of course, the NTB strategy, 2020 interim milestones that uh, we, we would, were not able to meet, whether it was the incidence rate. Um, instead of a 20% incidence, we got to an 11% reduction the number of TB deaths we were supposed to reduce by 35%, we reduced by less than 10%. And of course, uh, people living with TB and facing catastrophic costs, I can tell you that, you know, coming from a country like India, 
this still unfortunately continues. And again, that's related to universal health coverage and access to all people to diagnostics, essential drugs um, uh, and health products. If you look at other targets that we have on treatment, again, we are off the mark, whether it's TB treatment in adults, children, and in fact, we're doing uh, obviously worse in, in terms of MDR-TB treatment targets where we're only met 32% of the patients who should have been treated um, and even less for children. Of course, again, this relates to access to MDR-TB diagnostics. And we've seen in COVID pandemic as well that diagnostics was so neglected. Everyone talks about vaccines, but really if you look at diagnostics on the African continent, you know, you have in some countries a thousand fold less diagnostic tests being performed per population than in high income countries. Next slide. On TB preventive therapy, this is one area where South Africa has actually done well, particularly in relation to HIV infected people. But overall, we know that whether it's household contacts under five years or whether it's household contacts of all ages that the WHO you know, does advise TB preventive treatment for, for reasons that you know, are well known to, to all of us, these targets are far from, from being achieved. And, and then finally on the funding targets, we again are falling short. In fact, we need to um, quadruple the funding in terms of uh, providing universal access to TB prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and care, we now need to spend about $19 billion annually. And currently what we're spending is 5 billion. So we really need four times to spend four times as much to make sure that all patients everywhere in the world have access to diagnosis and optimum treatment. In terms of research, we had a very modest target of $2 billion a year. We're not even approaching that. We're only spending about 900 million. And we need to quadruple that and spend at least $4 billion a year if we are to accelerate uh, research on TB. Next. And then, you know, we'll see later the comparison between COVID and, H and TB, and we'll see how, you know, the two are in great contrast. Now, unfortunately, um, while South Africa made good progress in terms of TB, both HIV positive and HIV negative, we're seeing these upticks now in terms, especially in terms of um, TB incidence among HIV infected people and in mortality in HIV negative uh, people. And so this is very worrying. And we see the same thing globally as well. Next slide. Um, before we go to the global, if you look at the, the risk factors for TB in South Africa, the, uh, the by far the greatest, the biggest risk factor is HIV. Whereas uh, in India, for example, the biggest risk factor is, is undernutrition, which of course is related to poverty. And unfortunately, I think what's going to happen post pandemic because of the increase in poverty, the increase, you know, people have lost their jobs. There's been increased food insecurity. Uh, prices of food are going up further now because of the uh, conflict in Ukraine, the war. And so, um, you know, we're going to see more undernutrition, whether we like it or not. And in many countries, this is going to drive TB rates up. Of course, there's also smoking, uh, diabetes, alcohol use, and also to some extent, the environmental air pollution, which also contribute as risk factors to TB. Now, if you look at the uh, success rates uh, reported uh, from South Africa, and these are from the 2020 uh, WHO Global TB report, so obviously data coming from a little before that, um, you find the success rates really could be much better, you know, whether it's new uh, uh, drug sensitive cases or whether it's um, HIV positive cases, or of course, MDR and XDR TB. You know, we're having success rates between 57 and, and 79 percent, and this is really not optimal. Uh, as I mentioned, the TB preventive treatment for HIV positive people is very high in South Africa and not doing too badly in children under five as well. Next. If, can we go to the next slide, please? Now, I want to uh, spend a minute on this TB care cascade because I think this is uh, a good way of looking at what happens in a community and then trying to address the gaps. If, we, if you look at the left-hand side of the slide, and let's say 
you know, there are X number of people in the community. We know that from prevalence surveys or from estimates of TB um, prevalence and incidence. We know what the numbers to expect in a particular country or a particular region. And then if you look at the cascade on, on how many people actually accessed a TB diagnostic test, how many received a diagnosis of TB, how many got registered for treatment, how many then completed treatment and achieved treatment success, and then did not develop recurrence or die following TB, because we know that the risk of death is not just during TB treatment, but we know from cohort studies that once somebody has TB, their risk of dying is significantly two to three or even four times higher than age and sex and <clears throat> people matched for all of the other uh, parameters. So if you take a neighbor and you take someone who's developed TB, there's a difference in the, in the five-year and 10-year mortality. Uh, and we don't quite understand why uh, this is so. It's not only because of TB sequelae, but it, it, I think this is an area of research. Because again, maybe it's a pro-inflammatory pro <clears throat> situation that increases the risk of non-communicable diseases or cardiovascular disease, et cetera. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the right-hand side, we look at the care cascade. On, on the top, we see India. And uh, this is from a couple of years ago. So uh, expected TB incidence of 2.8 million cases per year in India. And we see that only 37% of these people had recurrence-free survival. So if you had 100 people with TB in the community, only 37% were cured and were living a healthy life. Similarly, for South Africa, when we look at the cascade, we find that 53% of people in the community with TB had a treatment success rate. And of course, if you followed them out as we had the data for India, then recurrence-free survival would be even lower. So this is actually, when you look at it like this, uh, it becomes very obvious that we're not doing a good job of finding people with TB and treating them effectively. And uh, you know, any other disease where we said, oh, we're curing you know, 35 to 40 or 50% of people with the disease, we would be shocked by that. We wouldn't at all be, uh, be satisfied. And yet when we talk about treatment success rates of 85 and 90%, we probably think we're doing a good job because we're not looking at all of the other places where these big drop-offs occur. <clears throat> and also, if we analyze the data this, in this way for each country, I think we would better be able to target the interventions uh, to where you know, the biggest gaps are. And I think the work that Professor Robin Wood um, and others are doing on transmission and really trying to understand. You see, we've had these old uh, uh, models and understanding of TB transmission. With COVID, we've learned so much more now about airborne transmission and we have wonderful ways of measuring that as well. So, um, so applying those techniques to understanding TB transmission and transmission of other airborne infectious diseases, I think is also an area of, uh, of high importance. Next slide, please. <coughs> Next. So what happened with COVID? Well, we know that, you know, because of all of the lockdowns and, and uh, all of the stringent measures that governments took in 2020, <clears throat> and many continued in 21, as we had different variants and waves of COVID-19 that we had only 5.8 million people reported uh, to the WHO who had access to TB care. This was down from 7.1 million in 2019. So 1.3 million less people were diagnosed. It wasn't that they didn't have TB. Clearly, you know, TB doesn't disappear like that in a year, but they were not diagnosed. Presumably they were not put on treatment. And next slide. And, and this of course resulted uh, in, in a sharp reduction in notifications and some of the high TB burden countries like India, Indonesia, Philippines, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and so on, also South Africa, all had significantly reduced notifications. Now, many of them did start recovering in 2021, but in most countries, we have not gone back to the pre-pandemic levels of case detection. Next. What also happened was that TB deaths increased. I mean, for the first time 
in, in many, many years, we saw an increase in the number of people who died from TB. Um, and this occurred in HIV negative as well as in HIV positive individuals with tuberculosis. Next. So the impact of the pandemic on the TB response was that TB deaths increased for the first time in over a decade. Fewer people were diagnosed and treated or provided with TB preventive treatment. There were fewer resources for essential TB services. We know, for example, from surveys that the WHO has been doing, uh, looking at essential services, uh, health services, that um, includes immunization, maternal, childcare, TB, malaria, HIV treatment, et cetera, that these were all impacted, uh, partly because healthcare workers were all busy with COVID or had been mobilized for COVID, uh, and also because of disruptions in travel and, uh, uh, and hospitals um, shutting down or, or becoming COVID hospitals that, that people with other diseases had uh, fewer uh, limited access to health services. Next. So what this is telling us is that we really need to step up our efforts because again, when you look at the projections, at the models that showed how you could bend the curve of TB incidence with, multi with different kinds of interventions, you know, starting from just doing a better job with existing um, interventions, but also then doing active case finding or doing preventive therapy, mass preventive therapy or mass vaccination, and you can see those different curves. But on the, on the right-hand side, again, you see the same interventions now having less impact because of this pandemic and post-pandemic increase in TB incidence. And therefore, uh, we're, we're off. We're, we were already off target before the pandemic and we're further off the TB targets now because of the impact of the pandemic. And so again, what this is telling us is that we need to invest more resources, but also that we need a lot more innovation. We need faster innovation and we need to scale uh, the innovations which are shown to be effective very rapidly. We cannot take decades to, to implement things that we know work. Next. In COVID, again, we've, we implemented so quickly. Um, so the actions, immediate actions, we need to end the pandemic. Clearly, if we don't do that through uh, equitable vaccination and access to other health products like drugs and diagnostics, we're not going to be able to focus our attention on TB or for that matter, any of the other diseases that are really becoming quite um, challenging now, including non-communicable diseases, cancer, mental health, and so on. We need to highlight the worsening TB epidemic. I don't think a lot of people still um, are aware of, of these data. We need to certainly improve case detection. As I mentioned, we are missing uh, 4.1 million uh, cases of TB globally of the 10 million expected cases. We only uh, notified less than 6 million. Then in the short term, we need to increase investment in R&D. As, as I mentioned, we need a quadrupling of investment uh, to get better diagnostics, point of care tests, better vaccines, and also improved treatments. We need to include TB in pandemic preparedness and response. Uh, we lose uh, one and a half million people with TB every year, year after year after year, you know, for, for decades. Um, and this should not be acceptable anymore. And in longer term, of course, I think it's universal health coverage that is going to address the challenges of TB. It's equity, it's the social determinants of health, which need multi-sectoral interventions. Next. We, um, yes, as I mentioned, we need to vaccinate the world. This was an editorial by Madhukar Pai and Ayoade Alakija, who made a strong case for why it's important uh, uh, to have vaccine equity. And of course, the WHO, the Director General, uh, has been you know, extremely vocal about this right from the beginning. Even before we had effective vaccines, we were talking about vaccine equity and very, very disappointed to see how things actually turned out. And, this is why we need a pandemic treaty because this is not the way to deal with the pandemic. We cannot have such a fragmented response where high-income countries, you know, as usual, corner all of the resources 
leaving the low and lower middle income countries waiting at the end of the queue. Next. This has happened before with other diseases, of course. We've seen this happening with HIV. So we hoped against hope that it wouldn't happen with TB, with COVID, um, but it did. Now, one of the things, of course, that's really dramatic about COVID is the fact that we have real-time data. We have better data, we have data visibility, better usage, analytics, dashboards, COVID is a digitalized disease. Uh, and if you look at a platform like Gisade, which you know, is approaching 10 million genomes of SARS-CoV-2, they were set up for influenza about 12 or 13 years ago. And uh, they were able to very quickly set up a platform for SARS-CoV-2. And in fact, um, it was South African researchers, uh, Tulio de Oliveira and others who identified the Omicron variant and within a matter of days, the world knew about this new variant that it was identified first in South Africa. I mean, that is just amazing stuff. But TB remains an analog disease, relying on paper-based systems, annual reporting. Of course, we're trying to change that. You know, we have now a dashboard with uh, as real time as possible T TB data. But certainly, the kind of opportunities now that have uh, we've seen happen with uh, with COVID. We need better investment in data systems. We need a gisade like platform for other pathogens, for TB, where all re, you know, program managers and researchers can, can share TB drug resistance data, whole genome sequences of TB, along with the clinical and phenotypic data. We connected diagnostics, use of crowdsourced data. All of these offer the opportunity for us to rethink TB surveillance and uh, case notification. Next. So that's one big area I think that we need to focus on improving. The other, of course, is the use of digital tools, artificial intelligence. Um, again, the, the number of digital solutions that we have used, smartphone apps, chatbots for uh, interactive education, for uh, risk assessment, for referrals, for contact tracing. Um, we could, um, there are many innovations in artificial intelligence, of course, we have used AI in TB as well. Many countries have now started routinely using artificial intelligence to do x-ray reading. We could uh, integrate COVID and TB um, testing. There are now portable x-ray systems with artificial intelligence. You could mount on a van and go into a remote area and people could be given their diagnosis there and then. If you also had a molecular testing device with you. We are now developing, we have cough analyzers using AI and digital stethoscopes. Um, but COVID has accelerated the innovation in all of these areas, and these could certainly be re-engineered for TB. Next. We, so these are some examples of some of the uh, interactive um, apps that have been used for a number of uh, applications in, in COVID for contact tracing, but also interactive chats, chat bots, et cetera. And there is no reason why we shouldn't be using these really to help our patients with TB, both you know, adhere to treatment with their compliance, they can get in touch if they had any questions or side effects, but also to do contact tracing and, and track and follow up the contacts. Next. We uh, have seen so much innovation uh, in sample collection and in, in diagnosis, starting with, you know, we started with standard RT-PCR and today we have little kits which you can buy at your local pharmacy and test yourself if you had symptoms uh, and you have so much confidence now because you know if you have a cold and you want to make sure you don't have COVID because you don't want to be infecting other people at home or at the workplace in 15 minutes you actually can do a test. Um, uh, of course the price varies from uh, place to place but um, it can be very reasonably priced there's absolutely no reason why these kind of kits should not be available everywhere. In fact, the WHO has just come out with guidelines on COVID-19 self-testing. Um, HIV self-testing is something that's uh, quite uh, uh, widely prevalent now. And so, again, we need to apply some of these innovations to TB and, and see you know, better sample, samples like using saliva or nasal swabs. If we could do that and show that it works for TB, that would be fantastic. But also then, you know, 
lateral flow tests uh, uh, and so on, which can be done easily you know, at point of care. Next, of course, this needs research because TB is not COVID. And so I'm not suggesting that it would be the same or it would be as easy, but, but we were able to do it uh, for COVID in a record time. Again, integrated testing platforms like uh, the Gene Expert and, and other molecular testing platforms, including TrueNAT that uh, was developed in India, can also be used to test for multiple pathogens. And again, this is something, if we look at it from a point of the primary health care uh, for an individual who comes with a particular set of symptoms to the health center, they want a diagnosis. That individual wants a diagnosis. Uh, and, and therefore, having these kind of platforms that you could use with different cartridges or different chips to test for different infectious diseases could really help uh, deliver better quality primary health care. Next. So this slide actually shows in the contrast between TB, which of course is a disease that's been around with man for mankind for, for many, many uh, millennia, not even centuries, but millennia, and COVID. The pathogen for TB was discovered in 1882, and we, it took 39 years. In 1921, we had the first vaccine. SARS-CoV-2 discovered, well, early 2020, really, because uh, it was on the 10th of January that we knew that it was a novel coronavirus. And in less than a year, we had a, not just one, but many vaccines. We have one vaccine for TB uh, now, which is licensed and is effective only in children um, to prevent severe disease. We have already 18 at least licensed vaccines for COVID and many, many more in the pipeline. 109 in clinical stages of testing, 14 for TB, financial investments, 107 billion for COVID, uh, some, somewhere around 0.1 billion for TB and annual deaths from the two diseases, almost the same but a thousand times greater investment in COVID vaccines. And it paid off. Next, we also have new platforms now like mRNA, which obviously we can use. So that's again, an innovation, different platforms for vaccines now. We should be testing all of them. Of course, we also need to, uh, to work more on, on having some surrogate markers so that we don't have to go through these huge phase three clinical trials uh, for TB. But till we have good surrogate ma uh, markers, we will have to go through those clinical trials. Again, I mentioned the inequities uh, that we've seen during the pandemic. They actually highlighted existing inequities or rather they exacerbated them. And so we were thinking about the R&D system, the global R&D system and how, why we do need to change it. I mean, we cannot continue with a system where there's huge amount of investment of public funds, of taxpayer money, of philanthropic funds. And at the same time, when things are developed, they are not available. They don't become accessible to people, even in those countries that have actually funded the, the research, because very often the intellectual property then is in the hands of private players who can use it the way that they deem fit. And I really believe that this needs to change. Next slide. And we proposed in a recent uh, paper that was published in Nature earlier this year that all stakeholders in public interest R&D, and when we say public interest R&D, we're talking about public goods for health. A vaccine, for example, is a life-saving uh, tool that should be considered a global public good. First thing we need to do is to prioritize public health needs through an inclusive, transparent, and informed process of priority setting. So the priority setting itself needs to be done through an inclusive and a transparent process, not something that um, a donor, for example, is dictating. Secondly, of course, we know that research must be ethically conducted and it should be scientifically sound. Far too many clinical trials we saw during the pandemic were conducted, which were too small and could never have answered the question that they set out. And so rather than waste resources, it would have been much better to set up a few platform trials like the solidarity trial of the WHO, like the recovery trial in the UK and a few others 
which can really go about answering the question and which can be generalizable. And you know, you have cross-country, multi-country uh, clinical trial platforms. Thirdly, we must mandate, incentivize, and facilitate rapid and open sharing of inputs, of processes, and of outputs. So data sharing from research happened during the pandemic. Uh, researchers were not waiting for papers to be published. Nobody was waiting for uh, publications before putting on public databases, whether it was sequence data, whether it was new protocols, or whether it was actual findings from research studies. They were all out on preprint. Very important that we provide timely access to health technologies that are safe, efficacious, and offer therapeutic advances. We need to ensure that the R&D effort are, is meeting the needs of subpopulations. And again, this is something that we've seen and we've talked about a lot about pregnant women, about children, about older people always being left behind. So we need to start thinking about these subpopulations right at the beginning when, you know, we're of course, this, I'm talking about product R&D here. Uh, recognizing contributions fairly. So again, traditionally researchers from the global south have felt disadvantaged, particularly when they share their data uh, on these open access platforms, but then don't always receive the credit where credit is due. We, so we need to recognize contributions both uh, for, for their academic purposes, like co-authorship of manuscripts um, and so on and sharing the credit but also sharing the benefits in terms of if there's a product that's being developed using this you know, openly shared data, then we need to ensure. So these are some of the principles. Uh, and then finally, the affordability, availability, and suitability of the products also needs to be built into the R&D process. And, and hopefully some of these principles will make their way into a pandemic treaty that's currently being negotiated at the WHO. Uh, and it has equity at the heart of, of all of the discussions. Next slide. We know that research is critical uh, and you've probably all seen this slide before about you know, how we're going down in terms of TB incidents at a very, very slow pace. And if we really want to accelerate that, then we need to not only scale existing innovations, but also really step up research so that we can identify better vaccines and, and better treatments and better diagnostics. Next. If you can click again and click again. So, so we need to do all of these things. And if we can introduce new tools by 2025, then we have a good chance of actually really um, changing the curve and, uh, and pushing the incidents down and getting to the kind of uh, goals, targets that we've set ourselves by 2035. But of course, again, as I've mentioned with COVID, we've actually taken a step back and therefore we, we would need to accelerate even more. Next. So again, we talked about the cascade of care and therefore we need to intensify research across the spectrum. It's not only about developing new products. Of course, we need to discover we need to continue discovery research, preclinical research on biomarkers, on surrogate markers of protection. Um, but we also need to look at the cascade and see what's happening there uh, and where there are gaps and how can we um, you know, bridge those, those gaps. It's also about pharmacovigilance. It's about regulatory science. Um, and I was very happy recently when I was in South Africa uh, and I met um, Linda Gale and her team, but also had an opportunity to talk to the team at SAFRA, the South African regulatory agency, uh, and was very impressed with the kind of vision uh, that has been developed um, there. Um, Biorepositories actually are great uh, to support both current and future scientific investigation. And um, I want to mention the report cohorts that uh, are now in many countries around the world that are really following TB patients, their household contacts, as well as people with latent TB collecting biological specimens and saving them so that a lot of discovery work can actually be done from these very well characterized um, specimens. So we need, of course, investments because all of these things, if they are to be done properly, uh, including implementation science, operational research, 
all of them need support, need funding uh, in order to accelerate innovation. And so we used to talk about US 2 billion as a need for annual R&D, but now because of the setbacks, we're actually estimating that we're going to need closer to 4 billion uh, US dollars a year. Next. And so these are some of the uh, guidelines or, or products that the WHO has developed around research, promotion of research financing, identifying global TB priorities, as well as normative guidance to support country approach to research. We also have product uh, preferred product characteristics and target product profiles to promote the development of vaccines, diagnostics, and treatments. Next slide. And this was a, the global strategy for TB research and innovation that was uh, adopted um, in 2021. Next. So there are some examples, uh, again, of being able to accelerate the end-to-end -end process. And this is a particular example called the Global Accelerator for Pediatric Formulations that was catalyzed by WHO, but in uh, collaboration with a large number of other partners, where you start with the prioritization of what the gaps are, what the needs are, um, then have a plan, a business development and a product development plan, along with the attention to regulatory affairs. And then you actually, once that product is developed, of course, this is by the private sector, then there has to be a policy guidance, there has to be uh, plans on how this is going to be procured and distributed, how it's going to be rolled out, the uptake, and then of course, the monitoring. Next. The, the GAPF program is focused on pediatric uh, medicines because it's a neglected area. There's no, not much investment. Companies are usually not interested because volumes are small. So good example is pediatric Dolutegravir where uh, people came together um, to identify that there was a gap, there was uh, guidelines that were developed and um, generic Dolutegravir tablets were developed, regulators were involved, um, the, the endpoints of, of the studies that were needed in children were well defined. And therefore, this was a good example of how you could accelerate the development of a pediatric uh, formulation for a drug that didn't exist. And we know that for many TB drugs, second line drugs in particular, um, one does not have good pediatric formulations next. And in fact, pediatric research is, is often, uh, you know, lagging. Uh, lagging behind. I think we can go to the next slide. I've mentioned um, how such an approach, and we, we want to try and take this approach for other products as well, not just for pediatric, but for identifying gaps in, in uh, certain products for public health areas. Again, we, we can talk about this later, but it's really important that, that um, instead of ex excluding pregnant women all the time, we should think about how to include them fairly and ethically. And rather than protecting pregnant women from research, we should be protecting them through research. And rather than think of them as a vulnerable population, think about them as a complex population. Um, and I'm sure Joy would have a lot more to say about this. Next. So in terms of the highest priorities in TB research, if you look at diagnostics, of course, a biomarker test would is, is, is the kind of a holy grail, particularly that would detect all forms of TB. Also a triage test that can be used by say community health provider, first contact healthcare provider, something to replace smear microscopy, which is unfortunately still being used widely and a drug susceptibility test, which can be used at the you know, most peripheral health center. Um, again, we talked about COVID and, and all of the innovations that have happened in diagnostics there. And hopefully some of that can uh, also uh, impact on TB diagnostics. In therapeutics, we need better, more shorter treatment options to prevent TB disease. And of course, to treat disease, we're making some progress now, especially on XDR-TB treatment with the BPAL regimen. We've also just published data on the four month uh, We've just published guidelines that show that four months for children is uh, as good as six months. So research like that is really uh, important. Um, next slide. 
because if we can get to shorter, more effective regimens, then I'm sure that more we can have more TB patients actually complete their treatment. So there are a number of drugs. So this is actually quite promising in phase one, phase two, and phase three, but it also means that we need a lot more clinical trials happening. And South Africa has been a leader in clinical trials for TB as well as for TB HIV, but we need more countries, we need more investment, we need more multi-country and hopefully more platform trials that can quickly enroll patients um, and even use adaptive trial designs like we did in COVID so that you can roll on and roll off different interventions. Of course, again, TB is a different disease than COVID. It takes much longer to get to clinical endpoints, but, but still that shouldn't be an excuse for not being able to do things more efficiently. Next. And of course, many of these companies also need uh, incentivizing in order to continue their R&D in TB. Um, again, there are many um, trials going on for um, uh, to treat TB infection um, and shorter regimens, once weekly, INH, rifapentine um, <clears throat> for 12 weeks, or daily for, for one month. These have been shown to be <clears throat> as good as six or nine months of isoniazid. Um, but it would be great to have an even easier regimen to take, or if we could have a post-exposure vaccine that could be given, it would be just one shot given to all household contacts. And if that could protect against reactivation, then it would be fantastic. Next. Um, and so we have a number of new uh, treatment guidelines. I'm just mentioning it here. You may be all familiar, or you can always look these up. Um, there are multiple modules that have been released um, for both diagnosis as well as treatment of TB. Next. And we will have new guidelines on uh, MDR-TB treatment. Um, and just a couple of highlights from the 2021 update that a four-month quinolone-based regimen was found to be as good as a six-month standard regimen for the treatment of drug-sensitive TB in adults. And as I mentioned, the SHINE trial in children just showed that a four-month regimen using standard drugs was as good as a six-month regimen for uncomplicated uh, pulmonary TB in children. Uh, in terms of the drug-resistant TB uh, guidelines that are just coming up, we will be looking at the BPAL regimen and updating the all oral shorter regimens for MDR-TB as well as the BPAL regimen for pre-XTR uh, and XTR-TB. Next. So finally, you know, there's good news and progress on the treatment uh, possibilities for, M for XTR and pre-XTR-TB. But again, we need to make sure that these get implemented in countries fairly quickly. And I know that countries are reluctant because sometimes they've already procured drugs or placed orders, and it, it takes a while to change. But really, we should be looking, prioritizing patient outcomes in this case, because there's a huge gap between existing TB treatment outcomes for XDR and what we can achieve with the BPAL regimen. Again, in terms of vaccines, well, we're making extremely slow progress, unfortunately. Uh, we had the VPM um, vaccine, which is a recombinant BCG, that's being, uh, again, a number of trials done in South Africa, neonates, both uh, you know, HIV exposed and unexposed. There are trials going on in India, looking at household contacts to reduce, to see if it reduces the risk of incident TB. Also in TB cured patients to see if it can reduce recurrence and in healthcare workers to see if it can reduce TB infection. So a number of very interesting trials going on, but again, waiting for results. And a number of other vaccines like the M72, we had phase two results many years ago. We still don't have uh, a phase three, a definitive phase three trial that started. The Gates Foundation is now preparing the ground for a multi-country trial uh, using the GSK M72 ASO1 vaccine. And hopefully that will get off the ground sometime in 2023. And it'll be great to see South Africa and India actually leading on trials like this. Next.
So uh, uh, coming towards the end of my talk, uh, it's really, I think, looking at TB holistically, um, not siloing it. Um, again, I go back to the care cascade just because I think it's such a important, um, uh, you know, and, and a new way of looking at, at TB because ultimately, you know, you realize how few people you're reaching. And so we can then address issues related to case finding, to diagnostic workup, linkages to treatment, retention and care. And again, many of these now using the new digital tools that we have access to, we can do much better with. And of course, medication adherence as well. Social support, nutritional support, um, addressing stigma, uh, addressing the many social issues that patients with TB have. We know the TB patients come from sometimes the poorest sections of society in every country, actually. It's the, it's the poorest people in every country that suffer the most from TB. Uh, and therefore, we, we need to make sure that we're addressing, and I, I know from my own experience of visiting TB patients in their homes, how humbling it is uh, where one sits in a clinic taking a very biomedical approach to TB and sort of preaching to TB patients about what they should or shouldn't be doing, then you visit their homes, you see what challenging conditions they're living under. The fact that you know, they, they really don't know where their next meal for the family may be coming from and why TB treatment then is not their first priority. And then you realize that the way to sort that out is not just by hammering on about TB treatment, but addressing all of you know, the other needs that they have. And this is why investment in universal health coverage, in reducing the out-of-pocket expenditures, whether they're for TB or other diseases, and in addressing the social determinants of disease are going to be so important and why there's such high priorities for WHO. Next slide, and I think that is probably my final slide, is also... Uh, the Swiss cheese model that everyone's become so familiar with in terms of COVID-19. And we say, oh, we must use multiple interventions. Ma masking alone is not enough. You know, vaccine alone is not enough. Social distancing alone is not enough. Ventilation alone is not enough. But when you do all of them, then you reduce the risk significantly of you getting COVID or passing it on to anyone else. And similarly, for TB, we need to think about societal interventions, the social determinants and equities, BCG, public education and, and community engagement, stigma reduction, so that it can lead to early care seeking, then the personal protection like face masks, cough etiquette, screening and for infection and disease and taking TB preventive therapy, and then the person-centric healthcare system, which should be able to offer diagnostics for early detection of TB, quality care, including safe and effective regimens, patient support, including nutrition, social and mental health, sick leave, managing comorbidities, and TB infection control. Each of these interventions has imperfections, which are the holes that you see in the Swiss cheese. But when you have multiple layers, then it improves the success overall of the program. And, and then you see at the bottom the misinformation mouse, because that's, again, um, the stigma is also related um, in, in some ways to disinformation and misinformation that spreads. We've seen that happening now with COVID, with some of the treatments, as well as with vaccines. Um, this happens all the time with other diseases as well. And so addressing those through health literacy, through good communication, and most important, I think, is political will and leadership. And I think South Africa has been a shining example of that as far as TB is concerned. So with that, I, I, I come to the end of my presentation and I turn it back to the chair. Happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Somi. I think that was just a terrific tour de force. And um, you said you had a 30,000 uh, mile view of COVID-19. I, I think you do of all of our health issues. Um, 
you know, uh, uh, and we really do count it a great honor to have had you for the last uh, hour or so. Really appreciate uh, your input. So there have been a number of questions in the uh, in the chat in the Q and A. I don't know if we're going to have time to get through all of them. So apologies if we don't get to it all of them, but I'll try and sort of round them up thematically as well, so that um, maybe more than one question can be dealt with at a time. Um, so we certainly had some interest in IPT, and I guess always uh, that is one of the, you know, the, the conundrums in, in the TB response. So there was a question about resistance with IPT and then the use of 3H um, and, you know, perhaps why some of these tools are not being scaled up. So I wonder if you want to take a bit of a comprehensive view of that, um, Somia, that, you know, we, we have had innovation, yet we haven't taken all of that innovation to scale. Yes, thank you, Linda Gale. I think it's been a problem with TB and um, I'm not sure I understand the reasons entirely as to why we have been so reluctant to scale innovations, even after there have been not one, but several clinical trials that have shown, and you gave a good example of INH preventive therapy. Somehow there's an entrenched view, especially among doctors, practitioners of TB, and not necessarily those in public health programs, but you know, individual practice that uh, monotherapy with INH will invariably lead to drug resistance. And despite many, many studies showing that this is not true, uh, it's been very difficult to change the mindset and this then impacts policy. So I think again, this relates to our difficulties in perhaps as researchers failing to make the case effectively um, to policymakers uh, and, and uh, its translation of evidence into policy, I think, which, uh, which is an issue here. And I really hope now that when, with the new data coming out on these regimens that are effective, more effective, both the shorter regimens for adult drug sensitive and childhood TB, but also the BPAL regimen, for example, for MDR, for XTR TB, that countries will want to move quickly uh, to those regimens. Um, and I don't know if it's, we need, it's more advocacy that we need. Um, maybe TB patients need to organize. Um, and we've seen the difference between HIV, which organized, you know, so well, so effectively, the activism really brought uh, uh, advances, innovations. But for TB, it's very difficult because these people are quite disenfranchised and they're so sick themselves. And then they're also dispersed and um, they're, you know, they're, they're, maybe there's some progress there now, but maybe we need a lot more of that, a lot more of uh, action you know, by civil society um, in well, order I, to bring attention to these issues. Yeah, thanks, Somia. And I think that leads beautifully into Mary Kinney's uh, comment here. It's a good friend of ours and a friend of Steve's. Um, she raises the, not only the community involvement, but political will. Um, and she, you know, correctly points out that perhaps again, another stark contrast between uh, maybe there was too much politics in COVID come to think of it. But how do we, um, how do we bring, what lessons can we take from COVID politics that are relevant to the TB community? What have we learned from public health being at the forefront of politics? And I'm sure you have a real sense of pros and cons in that regard, but I wonder if you want to reflect for a bit. I think we saw that um, politics has a huge impact, right? On the way that uh, public health programs that diseases were managed. We saw the contrast between countries where political leadership actually took the advice of scientists. They did all of the right public health measures and they calibrated it in response to the changing situation and they were science driven uh, and other countries where it was just on a whim or uh, completely irrational policy decisions were being made. And, and so there's also, of course, the, uh, the fact that I think this is the first pandemic that we've had in the social media age. And that had a huge impact, I think, the way in which both 
information, but also disinformation was spread and the speed at which this went on. So this actually is creating more challenges, I think, for us, for, for scientists and for public health people on how best we can communicate and deal with, with this infodemic uh, as well. So I, I'm not sure I have, I have all the answers, but certainly I think for an airborne disease like TB, we can make the case that no one is safe until everyone is safe, just like we've made, because you can have MDR TB, we know, you know, go around the world or spread on airplanes, et cetera. Uh, the difference, of course, between COVID and TB has been that COVID truly has affected everyone around the world, whereas TB is still a disease largely of the poor uh, and therefore tends to be neglected. So I think we need to have countries that have high burden of TB actually becoming the champions and, and uh, stepping up, stepping up and, and making those investments and really not waiting for a, a, a trickle down. And we've seen affordable innovations coming from countries uh, for COVID around the world. Uh, and a lot of interest now in Africa on innovation, on setting up manufacturing for mRNA, for example. There have been investments now in many countries, the mRNA hub in South Africa itself, in Cape Town, but also the, we've set up now spokes in six other African countries. So there could be networks now that can get activated, that can look beyond COVID at diseases like TB and, and have innovation happening in Africa. Uh, I don't see any reason why this, this should not be the case. Yes, and that, uh, that raises the whole question of prevention. I know this is a tough one, but maybe to uh, maybe just a few thoughts to Serenia on why has it been so hard to get an effective TB vaccine? And in fact, I point out to people, there's an excellent article in Spotlight, which is a South African publication, again, in honor of World TB Day, really looking at our TB vaccines and you know how, how that pipeline looks and what some of the challenges there are. But Sumia, we haven't done very well. One single vaccine that isn't brilliant, um, you know, just maybe a few thoughts about TB vaccines. Yes, I don't think we've done well at all. I think we really feel, I feel ashamed when I look at what's happened with COVID and, uh, and where we are with TB, I mean, just absolutely nowhere. But again, I think one can be optimistic because of the investments that have gone into developing these platforms. We now have the platforms. We have viral vector platforms. We have mRNA platforms. We know how to do subunit protein vaccines. The issue now is really identifying the right epitopes and antigens to be included in a TB vaccine. And this has been, of course, the problem um, for malaria, for TB, for HIV, because these are very complex pathogens. They're not uh, simple. Um, and we do not fully understand the immune response to any of these infections. And so I think with COVID, we were lucky, but also there was a spike protein, you know, work done with previous coronaviruses that had identified that as a as uh, probably the, the best immunogen vaccines were made and, and investments had been made into, you know, the, the fusion, uh, pre-fusion uh, configuration of the spike protein, that actually worked. It was a gamble, but it, it worked and all of the vaccines then used that and, and they were successful. Now for TB, we have, haven't got to that point. And the M72 is probably the closest we got, but again, we, we don't know because we only have a phase two B study. And unless we do a phase three in a larger population, we will not know if that is the right. Uh, uh, so we have to work on several things. We have to work on the surrogate markers, but we can also now using, we can't do human challenge models. So that's again, a problem that whereas for malaria, for example, the human challenge model works well for SARS-CoV-2, we now have human challenge models. So there are many uh, reasons why it's so difficult and th these are real solid scientific and technical challenges. It's not that people haven't been trying, but I think with more investments and more collaboration and using these new technologies that we have, perhaps mRNA is something that can be done much faster. And so you could actually test it in an animal model, and at least you could test a number of different formulations and then uh, you know, start down selecting those which look most promising. So 
we if we had the right investments, I think for TB vaccines, we could probably start making making more progress. But we need global collaboration, private and public sector collaboration as well, and we need investments. And I think this is what the WHO is trying to do. Actually, we are working with with both philanthropic uh, partners, but also some of the companies that have the mRNA technology and say, how can we use this technology? Even if you're not willing to share it for COVID, they are uh, willing to, to have networks of academics work on other diseases using their mRNA platforms. So I think there's, there's some um, hope on the horizon there. There is a silver lining. Indeed, and uh, I'm going to have to wrap up the questions here, maybe just to, you know, shout out, I saw an excellent question about artificial intelligence and the need for surveillance and um, from our colleague in Singapore, thank you for that and obviously recognize the importance of epidemiological innovation in this era. Uh, I'm sure, Sumia, you absolutely agree that investment in basic science research cannot you know, be excluded in this call for more research. Um, you know, the interaction at a clinical level of COVID-19 and TB also is something we, we could have spent a lot of time discussing. Maybe I'm going to wrap up just to ask you in just a few words, um, the importance of behavior in all of this. Again, COVID-19 uh, underpinned that, but stigma. Stigma continues to dog both the TB and the HIV epidemic. Maybe just one last shout out for what needs to be done around stigma. Yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. And, you know, in, um, when, we, when we first started seeing HIV in, in India, we then realized the TB patients uh, who actually experienced so much of stigma then felt, ah, here's another, here's a disease which, you know, has even more stigma um, attached to it. And um, it's really sad. I mean, stigma happens because of fear of the disease. If, you know, if there's no proper treatment or cure and, and there's a high likelihood of dying from it or from something that's unknown, uh, but also from myths and things, you know, which are more cultural and which have been propagated over the years. Um, for example, you know, believing that TB is genetic and therefore not marrying into a family that has had TB in the past. That's very common in India, for example. So I think for stigma, one needs social and behavioral scientists to understand what is underlying that stigma. What are the reasons? What are the beliefs? And then addressing them through that lens, uh, which is very, you know, has to be very contextually uh, relevant and it will be different for different uh, countries, most likely. So it needs, so this is why, you know, social and behavioral sciences and research needs to be an integral part. And we haven't, I haven't spoken much about that, but I do want to make that point at the end because without that, I, I believe that no public health program can be successful and even the WHO didn't have it. We've now set up a behavioral insights unit that will work with technical departments across WHO to really look in depth at these issues, which could actually pose huge barriers. I mean, vaccine hesitancy is one that we've all been talking about of late, but I think stigma is, is another one. Fantastic note to end on. Uh, it's not one single thing we can focus on. We do have to learn to chew and walk at the same time and do many things uh, to the best of our ability. Sumia, you have done yourself proud this evening. We really appreciate again um, an excellent, excellent talk. Um, I said in, in the Twitter sphere earlier, Steve would be smiling and I'm sure he is at this moment. So thank you so much again. And thank, thank you. you to everyone for great questions. Sorry, we didn't get to all of them. Uh, we'll see if we can't get back to you on some of those questions. And of course the whole uh, proceedings will be uh, available as a recording after this. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Thank you, Sumia. please don't go away. We, we have the last of our, uh, of our presentations to go. Uh, it's my pleasure to mention that beyond the, uh, the awarding of the lectureship, uh, there is a wonderful TBHIV Research Leadership Prize. And uh, this is uh, in honor of a young researcher. Um, it recognizes uh, somebody who has made a contribution, much as Steve did, 
in his early part of his career. The winner has a fellowship to attend the Union World Conference on Lung Health, a certificate and award, um, a profile in the Lancet, and an invitation to attend the next Steve Lawn Memorial Lecture. So of course that will be in London next year. We really encourage you to put your nominations in and share this widely. Um, we, there is a committee who reviews the nominations and, and then the individual is selected through a peer review process. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have had a wonderful array of previous prize winners, and here you see them lined up. Each have are continue to make an excellent contribution to the world literature. Uh, their selection is on a seminal paper or study that is then published. Um, and again, we congratulate all of these individuals. And it is now my great pleasure to tell you all about our 2021 prize winner. And Alberto is present in the audience. Alberto, I don't know if you want to turn on your camera at this point. Um, he, is, uh, he is somebody who has worked like Steve, both um, in Europe, but also in Africa here. He's done some terrific work in Mozambique. Uh, he is a clinician scientist uh, in Barcelona. Um, and is currently doing his, uh, currently, or have, have you completed your PhD in Amsterdam, uh, Alberta? I have completed the PhD. Great, Ready. brilliant. Um, so here you are, Alberto Garcia Bastera. Uh, congratulations for being awarded the fifth uh, year uh, as a prize winner. We have a short uh, video that Alberto did record for us before, so We'll, we'll watch that video now. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Alberto Garcia Basteiro and I work at the Manisa Health Research Center in Mozambique and at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health, ICE Global, in Spain as a researcher, as a clinical epidemiologist. And I'm tremendously honored for having received the Steve Long TBHIB Research Leadership Prize. First of all, uh, allow me to thank uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, the Desmond Tutu HIV Center at the University of Cape Town, and the Lancet for this recognition, uh, which I take as a recognition not only to me, but to the entire team that has been working in Manisa and, and in Barcelona with me all these uh, last years. Allow me to show special gratitude to Professor Joy Lon for her kindness and for her continued support. The, this award has a, a special meaning to me because I have always been a big fan of, of Steve's work and I have been following uh, his studies since I started to work on TB research around 10 years ago. Uh, and in fact, now I am leading a diagnostic evaluation and clinical trials, focusing on TB diagnostics in people living with HIV, uh, which was uh, an important field of interest for, for Steve. And now we are testing new point of care assays, uh, different molecular tests in different specimens and, and trying to improve the TB diagnostic algorithms in this vulnerable population. So Steve's work is tremendously important uh, for the field, but also for my, for my current work. I had the chance to meet Steve a few months before he passed away. I think it was his last trip uh, uh, outside the UK. And, and he came to Amsterdam, um, where I was doing my PhD, to attend the PhD defense of Dr. Andrew Kerkhoff. Uh, it was a, a, an unforgettable day. Um, although Steve was uh, quite sick at that time, uh, he showed tons of energy and passion for the work that, uh, that was being presented by, by Andrew. And I remember he spoke very little about, about TB or HIV but he gave us very important advices on how to do better research, how to be better researchers, how important teamwork is, how important capacity building is, and how important being, being kind to others 
and empathize with the pain and suffering of others is. So um, these are the, the, the values that he promoted during his career and that we should all pay much more attention to, especially in these difficult moments the, the, the world is, is currently facing. So um, finally, allow, allow me to wish you an excellent uh, World TB Day. Uh, the fight against TB hasn't been more important than uh, it is now, so keep up the fight. Um, I hope you have an excellent session with the always inspiring uh, Dr. Sumia Swaminathan uh, while we remember and celebrate the life and work of Steve Long. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado. Well, uh, thank you, Alberta, and I think all of you will absolutely join me in, um, you know, again, congratulating him and recommending him uh, for this award. So thank you, Alberta. Thank you for being with us virtually. Um, I think we have to do everything we can to see if we can't get you to London uh, next year, where, where I hope we will be in person. Um, but again, congratulations and keep up the good work. Thank you for reminding us that Steve was a wonderful clinician, a wonderful researcher, a terrific family man, a mensch, but he was also a terrific mentor. And you're quite right that he never, ever undervalued or under uh, emphasized the need for mentorship in, in people who followed. So uh, you do walk in his footsteps. So thank you for that. Um, great. Uh, we'll move to the next slide then. Um, and this is my opportunity to really pass the, 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 the mic, if you like, on to my dean at the health science faculty at the University of Cape Town, Prof. Lionel Green Thompson, uh, who will, as host this year, pass the baton on to the London School. Over to you, Lionel. Thank you very much, Linda Gale, and thanks very much for an incredible afternoon. This Steve Lawn lecture is becoming a, a significant part of our legacy here at UCT in collaboration with the London School. And so we're really grateful to have hosted this afternoon, I suppose this evening for some of you. So greetings to all of you from across, across the globe um, listening in on, on, on these proceedings. I, I want to thank especially the team who's put to, today together and I want to acknowledge especially Professor Joy Lawn on this occasion of recollection. Thank you to Dr. Sumia Swaminathan from the World Health Organization for an exceptional discussion today. I really took three main themes away from um, your, your reflections today that the, the story of TV is not a tale of victory yet, but one of ongoing sadness with ever recurring moments of hope in the journey, hope through the reorientation of research and development program in a way that ensure progress in this disease. But I, I noted your particular emphasis at the beginning of Steve, Steve Lawn's commitment to patient outcomes, and that you ended your talk with your own commitment to patient outcomes, which I thought was commendable. And, and particularly your reflections on the fact that through the Swiss, if we applied a Swiss cheese approach to reflect on the personal, social, and health system um, interventions that may be required. I think the third theme that I picked up in your talk was, especially in the comparison with COVID, this ongoing story of inequity that recurs in the story of TB. And, and I, I, I want to just pick up your commitment to the idea that the future solution of the inequity problem is through a universal health coverage process. And in particular, the role of the civic society in achieving those aims immediately for TB patients, but more globally for a health system that often neglects those who come in with the disease. This, this memorial this evening really celebrates Stephen Lawn's capacity to seamlessly insert himself into the African context to study, to build knowledge, and to build relationships. And importantly then to communicate the story of our struggle with TB and its destructive co-conspirator HIV. But this occasion is an important reflection of relationship, the relationship of Stephen Lawn with his patients and colleagues, but on a global scale, the relationship between UCT, the legacy of Stephen Lawn, 
and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. The, the slogan for this year's World TV Day of Investing to End TB and Save Lives, I think is a really important reflection that has emerged both from today's proceedings and is an ongoing, an ongoing commitment more globally. I want to acknowledge the winner of the award, Dr. Alberto Garcia Bastero. I really thought that your message in the video was incredibly inspiring. And I think young people like yourselves hold great hope for us in, in this space of, of, of dealing with the, the, the HIV TB pandemics. I want to close colleagues with an adage from, an Afri from the African tradition about, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think the award in this lecture give life to this adage. And it's an important thing that as we combine this award and this lecture, we will go further. But it's in the spirit of this going further that I hand over now to Professor Toyin Tobin, co-director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, to say a few words and to receive the baton in anticipation of the next event hosted in London. Professor Tobin. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Leonel Green Thompson. And um, I would like to first echo you, um, the appreciation that you've extended to um, uh, our guest speaker for this year, Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, for such an excellent and very enlightening talk. And also congratulate the, the, um, Alberto for winning um, the Steve Lund Mem uh, Leadership Prize for 2021. Um, as, as you've heard, we uh, the TB Center at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine will be hosting uh, the Steve Long Memorial Lecture in 2023, which we hope will be an in-person event. And uh, that will be on 23rd of March, 2023, which when I wrote the date down, actually a very unique, um, a very unique date. So we hope it will be an in-person event uh, in London, uh, but with uh, opportunity for people around the world to also join remotely. So we are hoping it will be an hybrid event. And uh, for that to happen, we are hoping that some of the things that Dr. Sumya Swaminathan mentioned in her talk today, particularly addressing the global inequity in, in access to COVID-19 will have been um, addressed because this is really crucial uh, to avoiding the emergence of another uh, variant of the, uh, of the coronavirus that could in, uh, that could amper or hinder the advances that have been made in um, the response to the pandemic. So um, with regard to the 2023 um, Steve Long Memorial Lecture, I would like to announce that we already have a confirmed uh, guest speaker for the event, and that is in the person of Professor Maduka Pai, uh, who is a Canada Research Chair in Epidemiology and Global Health at the McGill University and the Associate Director of the McGill International TB Centre in Montreal, Canada, who um, coincidentally happens to also be my former boss. So um, without much ado, uh, I would like to now um, invite Professor Joy Lon to um, give us some um, statements of appreciation on behalf of the family of Steve Lon and give a closing remark. Over to you, Joy. Thank you so much, Toyin, for passing the baton. And my job really is to thank everybody uh, on behalf of Steve. Um, so my name, Joy Lon, I just like to clarify, I'm not the sibling of Steve. I'm a postmodern feminist. So I was decided there were bigger things in life to worry about than changing your name. Um, so I was the wife and partner to Steve for almost 30 years. We moved continents six times, often on local government wages in Africa, and we made each other braver and sillier, and I hope kinder. Um, and this process really is part of continuing what he left too soon, the importance of delivering science that changes lives. And I just want to deeply thank Sumia for understanding that purpose that she subscribes to herself and that Steve did, that it's not about papers, it's about people. And then developing next generation science leadership. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, before Steve died, one of the things that he was really most sad about was that he was just starting to reach that point where he could see 
you know, ways to have impact for people and people in poverty. So before he died, because of uh, the partnership that is uh, exhibited here today, we were able to let him know that we were going to be having lectures each year that would carry on that communication of science and that would also carry on leadership development and mentoring, especially focused on research leadership for caring and action for TB and HIV in Africa. And honestly, none of us could have imagined. Here we are halfway through six amazing lectures and five just outstanding next generation leaders. And I wanna particularly thank Dr. Samir. You know, your lecture showed people-centered. I know it's WHO's model, but you showed it in your passion and your heart. It showed public health from the care cascades and reaching everybody, not leaving anyone behind to cheeses, Swiss cheeses, of course. Showed also the understanding of the underlying poverty, the need to be able to influence politics, the importance to have passion for data and to be ambition, have ambition about that as we've seen for COVID. How do we do that for diseases of poverty like TB? And then I was particularly happy to hear another P also pregnancy dropped in somewhere. So thank you just so much. I learned so much and I think all of us who listened did. And what we also saw was, as well as your head, saw your heart, which is really just beautiful. I'd also like to congratulate Alberto. And I'd like to move to the next slide because that science leadership and that prize that comes to Alberto and to others is because of a partnership of many people. And I'm just deeply grateful to uh, the Desmond Tutu HIV Center, the fabulous Linda Gale and her team, Tammy and Imam, to Professor Lionel Thompson and to Prof and to Busi, just absolutely fantastic, fantastic, important leadership. I just wish we could be face to face. The Desmond um, Tutu HIV Centre team have had a loss this year of Desmond Tutu, but have really raised above that. The London School TB Centre, Toyin is here and also his partner in crime, Finn, who has been fabulous. Thank you to both of you. Richard Horton, who has stood behind this and really been helpful, and the really inspiring Tony Harris and the union. And this motto in the middle was something that Steve put in his inaugural lecture. There is no I in research, it is we search. So the things that last and the things that matter are things that we do together. So if we could come to the next slide, I'd like to thank all of you who are still here and thank you on behalf of his wider family and friends. His mother, Rosemary, is on the lecture now and is just a remarkable woman. Tim is here and is three quarters of the way through a fast track PhD in neuroscience. Steve would be so proud to see you now. And if we come to the last slide, we search. <laughs> Let's take this forward. And in the year ahead, as Sumia has said, as each person who's spoken has said, there is so much more that we need to do for TB and for all diseases of poverty. Let us take the ambition that we've seen for COVID and let us apply that. We can and we must do more. Please be inspired, take courage, and we look forward to seeing you next year and deep thanks to everybody. We search. <laughs>